turn of the 20th century in Dayton, Ohio, Hawthorne Street looked much as it does today. Men and women are still living who remember how in the years 1900, 1901, 1902, 1903, the quiet, slow-spoken Wright brothers came walking down Hawthorne, back again from their journeys to Kitty Hawk. And how with that bent, alert, probing way of theirs, they strode past the homes of Vance the harness maker, Pahu the stone cutter, Wellborn the wagon maker, Wolfram the carriage trimmer. On this windswept beach in 1900, 1901, and 1902, they tested gliders they had built. They taught themselves to be pilots of a high order. They were critical men, but at last, their 1902 model pleased them. They flew it farther and with better control than any other glider that man had ever devised. They came back from Kitty Hawk in 1902 with a knowledge that they had solved flight's paramount secret, control. And in the spring of 1903, they designed a four-cylinder engine and fashioned two propellers. When they next went to Kitty Hawk, they flew. On December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made man's first four control flights in a powered airplane. That day, they lifted the world into a new dimension. the rights had achieved at Kitty Hawk barely evoked passing attention in a nation whose people were absorbed with the problems of a dynamic new age. There were other less celestial wonders closer at hand. The automobile, the telephone, the motion picture, but at number seven Hawthorne Street, December 17, 1903 was a momentous day had a special significance for the mechanic who worked in the Wright's bicycle shop, Charlie Taylor. Made all the different parts in the, in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So I made it out of a solid block of steel, uh, about 32 inches long, six inches wide, and inch and five-eighths thick. Cut it right out of the solid block by drilling holes and knocking out large pieces out of it, and then, uh, then turning it up in the lathe. The motor itself, from the time I started, well, I had it ready for test, was six weeks. Fifty years ago, I can remember as though it was yesterday almost. There was not a complete indifference to the Wright's discovery. A small group of Americans were laboring to further the art. And in Europe, where the airplane's military potential was quickly realized, a fresh wave of enthusiasm for aviation followed the Wright's success. In France, Blériot, Farman, and Briquet were flying airplanes of their own design. The Englishman Corey and the Brazilian Santos Dumont, most of whose experiments took place in France, also captured the imagination of Europe with successful flights. The Wrights had offered to demonstrate their airplane to the United States Army shortly after their first successful flights. The Army declined, preferring to develop its small fleet of balloons as an air arm. Oddly, it was a young balloonist lieutenant of the Army who finally was instrumental in obtaining a chance for the Wrights and their airplane, Frank P. Long. After four long years of failing to recognize the Wrights, finally, in December of 1907, the Board of Ordnance and Fortification granted the interview to Wilbur. At once, he inspired their confidence. This led to a contract in February of 1908 between the Wright brothers and the Signal Corps, in which they agreed to furnish an airplane that would fly 40 miles an hour, carry two persons, remain in the air for one hour, and, strange to relate, was to have some kind of a device by which, in case the motor stopped, it could be landed without crashing. In the summer of 1908, Orville Wright brought to Fort Myer, Virginia, the airplane that was to fulfill their specifications of the contract. Day after day, we watched him go fly around and around the field in his tuning up flights. And finally, on the 9th of September, he broke the world record by staying in the air for over one hour. On landing, he came to me and said, would you like to go up? You can guess my answer. 
And I made my first flight in an airplane that day with Orville Wright, six minutes and 40 seconds. Lieutenant Law became the first military officer ever to fly in an airplane. Eight days later, tragedy struck. On a flight at Fort Myer, Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge was killed. Orville Wright, injured. Benjamin Folloy had a chance to fly in the Wright plane at Fort Myer. On the day following the endurance uh, test with Orville Wright and uh, Lieutenant Lahm, uh, the Orville, with a quiet little grin on his face, uh, invited me to be his guest on the uh, crucial and final cross-country and speed tests. Shortly after we straightened out on the course for Alexandria, Orville, with this same little grin on his face, told me that uh, if he had to land anywhere on the route, and he'd pick out the thickest tumble trees he could find and land on top of them. Fortunately, the little engine that we had at the time carried us all the way through without any difficulty. And we finally landed back at Fort Mardrill ground with three world records, cross country, 10 miles, altitude 600 feet, and speed 42 and a half miles an hour. The United States Army had an airplane. The need now was for pilots. The principles of flight were now widely known, and designers were applying them to many types of aircraft. Glenn Curtis, Glenn Martin, and the Canadian J.A.D. McCurdy were designing and flying airplanes in competition and for exhibition. In Europe, the airplanes of Blériot, Pollum, Farman, and de Havilland were demonstrating obvious advances in both speed and range. And in Russia, Igor Sikorsky was taking his first steps into the age of flight. And I remember very, very well the early um, interesting period in France in 1909 and 1910. At that time, I had my share of uh, failures with the first helicopter, which was a fine machine, only it couldn't fly. Glenn Martin remembers an episode of his pioneering days. I've just been reading an old postcard sent by our family doctor to my mother, dated September 30th, 1910. This is at a time when I just began to leave the ground in a flying machine. <clears throat> and it says, for heaven's sake, if you have any influence with that wild-eyed, hallucinated young man, call him off before he is killed. Uh, have him devote his energies to substantial, feasible, and profitable pursuits, leaving dreaming to the professional dreamers. For a dreamer, Glenn Martin was attracting a remarkable group of clear-thinking young designers as workmen. The first to join him was Donald Douglas. I guess it must be getting old, because somehow it becomes fun to reminisce. Well, my first memory of things in aviation was seeing the first Wright airplane demonstrated for the Signal Corps in 1908 at uh, Fort Myers. It was Wilbur that got into the machine with, I guess it was Colonel Lom. And they pulled the old latch and down this little wooden track it went with those funny old props batting around at apparently a pretty slow speed and off she went. One of the first pilots was Roy Nobinshu who was a balloonist even before he became an airplane pilot. My friend Dick Ferris remarked to me one time, he said, I uh, have been an impresario. I've handled actors and prima donnas. But he says, these aviators start in where the other fellow leaves off. And he says, it's impossible to do anything with them. The ambitions of some designers went far beyond their skills. As Igor Sikorsky has said, in the history of aviation, there have been many contraptions which, to the good fortune of their inventors, failed to fly. 
sometimes were deadly serious in demonstrating the utility man could expect from the airplane. Lawrence Sperry, whose contributions to the aircraft instrument field were momentous, puts a pre-war aircraft through its paces. All this ferment, however often it seemed to lack direction, was contributing in one way or another to the growth of aviation. The airplane was growing cleaner in design. Its horsepower was more dependable. The disparaging term aeronaut was giving way to aviator, a term of respect. Aviation was emerging as a science. The pusher engine of early planes had been replaced by the tractor engine installations which allowed higher speeds. The Wrights were foreseeing these helpful aircraft devices and other inventors such as Elmer Sperry were inventing and refining them. Here, a Curtis seaplane flies with the early Sperry automatic pilot. Almost without exception in the first decade of the airplane, the designers were pilots. They built, tested, and flew their own designs. Wrights, Blériot, Santos Dumont, Curtis, Rowe, Sikorsky, de Havilland, and Martin. At Glen Martin's, a band of engineers and craftsmen had gathered together whose names and time would be synonymous with aircraft designs of world rank. Donald Douglas, James H. Dutch Kindleberger, Lawrence Larry Bell, Alan Lockheed, John Northrop. The United States was the cradle of flight. Inventors of a high order had appeared. Our pilots were unmatched. First-rate designers emerged. Brilliant men specialized in the components of the airplane. But as a pioneer who specialized in aircraft horsepower, Frederick B. Rentschler summarizes. Prior to World War I, our most important contribution to aviation was the flight of the Wright brothers. From December 1909 to March 1911, 13 months, the entire United States Air Force consisted of one officer, myself, uh, one civilian mechanic, eight enlisted men, and one airplane. The government at that time wasn't very keen about turning money loose for flying. I had uh, the great appropriation of $150 allotted to me to take care of the airplane for the entire year 1910. After each crack up, I used to sit down and try to puzzle out what had happened. Then I'd write to the Wright brothers and tell them all that I thought had happened. They'd proceed to write back and tell me what I ought to have done. In other words, I expect that I'm about the only man living today who learned to fly by correspondence. The air arm of the United States Navy began under equally apathetic circumstances. Naval aviator number three was Admiral John H. Towers. In the autumn of 1911, when I was quite a young naval officer serving aboard one of our battleships, I got the idea that I wanted to learn to fly, that naval aviation would amount to something for naval purposes. I also became a very close friend of Glenn Curtis, and uh, was associated with him throughout his whole life. The man had an enormous amount of vision. He had already conducted, in cooperation with the Navy, tests of uh, landing an airplane on a platform, on a cruiser, and also of taking off. But he had in his mind then the idea which later developed into the powerful carriers that we have today. The airplane now had official recognition, both from the Army and the Navy but it was a cautious acceptance. The time-forged armament still held sway. When the fledgling army flyers experimented with a primitive bomb sight and a Lewis machine gun installed in aircraft at College Park, Maryland, they landed and foresaw whole battles that someday might be fought in the air. The War Department promptly pierced that bubble. An official spokesman pointed out with finality that the army had airplanes for just one purpose, reconnaissance. From a pistol shot at Sarajevo, the first of the great modern world wars exploded. And almost overnight, all of Europe was engulfed in conflict. 
airplane was put to work just as the U.S. War Department spokesman had prophesied, as observation and scouting craft. The source of peril lay in the artillery, machine gun, and rifle fire, scourging the entrenched troops from across the wasted land. But in the air, Allied and German pilots often waved to each other as they passed on their observation missions. Then, instead of the courteous wave, the opposing pilots began exchanging pistol fire. Presently, the first crudely mounted machine guns appeared. Now the frantic race of inventing, improvising, adapting, and refining aircraft equipment began. Quickly, the Germans countered the hand-operated machine gun by installing upon their aircraft the invention of Tony Fokker, a machine gun synchronized to fire through the aircraft propeller. A paramount lesson that the Allies were to remember a generation later was being learned in air warfare for the first time. No design capable of still further development could be frozen. And countermeasures must be met by counter-countermeasures. It was becoming clear that no nation or race had a corner on inventive skill. While the single-engined airplane had been engrossing most designers, in Russia, Igor Sikorsky in 1912, I decided that the time came to build a large machine with several motors. At that time, I was certain already that the future of aviation will be connected with fairly large aircraft, that the closed cabin with its comfort, protection from wind and so forth represent a must. In 1913, I completed my first uh, four-motored airplane, <coughs> the Grand. The ship proved a complete success. It flew quite well. It the Grand's military successor, the Ilya Mormets, was the first four-engine bomber in world history. It struck time after time at the Central Powers on the Eastern Front. The internal combustion engine now became an instrument of intensive technical development. The first successful engine had not been developed until 1860. One of the world's foremost engine designers, Leonard S. Hobbs, recollects its history. It starts out actually with a little-known Frenchman by the name of Lenoir, who has never gotten the credit he deserved. He built and actually marketed the first internal combustion engine, and it was from his engine that the Wright brothers were able to build one. Of course, the early pre-war power plants are fairly well known, the Anzanis and the Curtis OXs. The First World War did mark a great advance in power plants. First, there were the rotaries, the clergies, the gnome rones. Then there was the Renault engine, which was a very good French engine. The British RAF engines. Toward the end of the war came the very beginning of what I think is the, is the modern engine. in which European antagonists had been tempered by three years of savage battle, whose equipment had been perfected by the necessity of survival without regard to cost, the United States now plunged. It was the world's 14th ranking air power with only 28 airplanes, 65 pilots, supplemented by 50 flying students. Its Navy combat air arm was even smaller. Its industry lacked integration. The nation that had allotted Benny Folloy $150 in 1910 for maintenance of that year's Air Force promptly voted $600 million to fulfill a plea by the Allies to have 5,000 airplanes and 4,500 pilots on the Western Front by the spring of 1918. When we entered the war, the country knew that the United States already had an industrial capacity double that of Great Britain, France, and Germany combined. We quickly realized that to supplement the meager aeronautical developments resulting from years of federal indifference to air power, we had to obtain licenses for the production of proved British and French airplanes and aircraft engines in our new factories. Our national mistake was the assumption that an instrument as dynamic as the airplane could be designed 
tested and developed overnight. One of the first young pilots to see action in France with the first aero squadron was Oliver P. Eccles. We'd been equipped with a new type of French airplane with a new and very much improved engines. These airplanes were assigned to us. The squadron had the strength of 18 airplanes. And we were assigned the mission of supporting uh, one of the American divisions one afternoon in the attack. Our airplanes took off 18 strong. During the afternoon, all of the airplanes force landed from engine failure. Fortunately, none of them behind the enemy line. But out of the 18 airplanes that went out, none of them got back. The pilots of World War I made the term dogfight synonymous with their work. America's top ace, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker of the famed 94th Hat in Ring Squadron, reflects on the different approaches to combat of the pilots of World War I and the pilots of today. That individualism uh, was possible because the planes were much slower. You'd stay in maneuver. Whereas today, it's impossible because of the tremendous speed, the difference of 100 miles an hour and six, seven, and six or 700 miles an hour. We had 150 horsepower. Today, if they haven't got five or 6,000 horsepower, it's no good. We had two little pop guns, 30 caliber, that would shoot sometimes 450 rounds a minute. Today, they've got six and eight 50 caliber guns that'll shoot 1,000 rounds a minute. A naval officer whose career has bridged two wars in aeronautics, Admiral DeWitt C. Ramsey. Naval aviation, let us say, took place in England, where during World War I, the latter part of it, the British converted two ships, the Furious and the Argus, and built into them the features which were desirable for aircraft launching and recovery. Uh, I happened to have been in England at about that period and kept our Navy Department informed of the progress of the British in this field. As a result, the Navy embarked on an initial program of converting the old Collier Jupiter into our first flat top, the Langley. In 1918, as the war began to move toward its climax, American aircraft equipment still had not entered combat. An intensive effort was being made to perfect the Liberty engine. Before the Liberty or any other aerial product of the United States designing boards could be put in action, the final critical offensive of World War I had begun. Millions of men pulled out of trenches to attack or retreat. Above them, to be sure, planes flew in bombing and strafing missions. Individual pilots whose names became legendary met in dogfights. In retrospect, it might be said that aviation itself has served a very small part in the result of the World War I conflict. A decade was dawning in American history that was to be known flippantly as the era of wonderful nonsense. Beneath its surface corruption, its wild enthusiasms, and its extravagant posturing, History now has found that it was a time in which men in many fields of the arts and sciences were employing immense physical energy to attain goals of a sober work. Aviation had its share of such men. The accomplishments of the 20s were presaged in 1919 by man's first flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The NC-4, a large flying boat whose development had begun during the war, was chosen, as the Navy's pioneer pilot Admiral Towers points out, for the ambitious task. When the war was over, the first one was just about completed. So I proposed to the Navy Department that we go ahead the following spring and uh, with as many of these aircraft as could be built by that time, that the Navy undertake to be the first to fly the Atlantic. Luckily for me, I was selected to command that expedition. It's all history now. Two of the three airplanes uh, landing at sea in very rough water were so damaged they couldn't make it, but the NC-4 made it from Newfoundland to the Azores to Lisbon. Army pilots already had inaugurated airmail service on May 15, 1918, a service that had been under discussion since 1910. 
William Boeing, who had entered aviation in 1916, was instrumental in starting the first international airmail service on the North American continent. In 1919, Eddie Hubbard and I took a flight up to Vancouver, B.C. On our return trip, the postmaster at Vancouver handed us a mail sack for delivery to the postmaster at Seattle. This was the first international mail ever carried by plane into the United States. Brigadier General William Mitchell, who had had a distinguished war record, argued that the Mahan Doctrine of Sea Power had been outmoded by the airplane and pleaded for a separate national air arm. He contended, in seeking a $60 million appropriation for Army Air Services, or about half the cost of a single battleship, that the United States could begin developing an air force which could hold mastery of both the air and the seas. Larry Bell was still with Glenn Martin when... That resulted in Congress bringing about a test wherein one of the targets that we were supposed to sink or try to sink was the famous Oster Friesland, the pride of the German Navy, which we had captured. This ship was anchored about 100 miles offshore, and six of the Martin bombers went out, each carrying a 2,000-pound bomb. They paraded over the battleship, and they dropped the six bombs, and only one hit it, and that was by mistake. The rest were timed to detonate at 100 feet below the surface, and it practically exploded the Oster Friedland. At least it ripped the bottom of the ship from bow to stern, and the ship sank in four minutes. The Navy had already begun systematically to broaden the scope of its Bureau of Aeronautics. Many of its men, whose views of the need for air power were not as vehement as Billy Mitchell's, nevertheless already had envisioned carriers as the heart of future striking forces. The nation's first large aircraft carriers, the Saratoga and the Lexington, were designed and were being built. These great ships, developing uh, approximately 180,000 horsepower, manufactured all of the wind that was needed in the absence of a surface wind for flight operations. The nation accepted the airplane and tacitly agreed with its advocates, but there was still no federal provision for long-range planning and procurement. Nevertheless, a core of designers and manufacturers stayed with the business. In the ceaseless drive to attain longer range and more reliable performance, the airplane, its engine, its components, and its instruments steadily were growing more complex. A great many great men have contributed to aviation purely as specialists. Sperry, one of the greatest. Colonel Clark, who devised one of the first good airfoils. Sam Heron came along on his cylinders and his fuel, and then Frank Mock with his carburation devices and later fuel injection. Frank Caldwell with his propeller. Mock, Hobbs, Sperry, Clark, Caldwell, Heron. The singular devotion with which these men and scores of other specialists pursued their particular fields leads H.M. Jack Horner, whose own specialty of aircraft production combined the fruits of all their labors, to say, That heritage of research, development, the background work that goes into aircraft has continued throughout the whole existence of aircraft and the great improvements that have come there too. After that, with flight becoming a little bit more common, I think it's important to realize the fervor with which those individuals did carry on their work. It was a passion with them. Then, midway in the 20s, came two events that turned the course of American aviation sharply upward. First, the government adopted the recommendations of President Coolidge's Morrow Board. These called for a sustained aircraft procurement program built on the foundation of a privately operated and technically competitive aircraft industry. The second event was the successful green Charles Lindbergh made come true. single-engine Ryan monoplane, Lindbergh had flown the Atlantic non-stop to Paris. Two weeks later, carrying Charles Levine as a passenger, 
Clarence Chamberlain flew the Atlantic and landed in Germany. First of all, we were trying to beat Lindbergh away. And second, we had to keep our plans a deep, dark secret because we had overheard Mrs. Levine say, if I thought my Charlie was going in that airplane, I'd burn it up. And as you see, we made it. Lindbergh's lonely adventure gripped the imagination of the world as one of man's most dramatic achievements. The nation turned from its casual cynicism to make the shy young pilot together with the airplane a shining symbol of the horizon still beckoning for conquest. From a military point of view, for the first time, our various types of combat planes were unmatched abroad. Moreover, we found the solid beginning of commercial air transport. Jimmy Doolittle pioneered transcontinental nonstop flights. In 1922, I flew from Pablo Beach, Florida, near Jacksonville to San Diego, California, a distance of about 2,200 miles in 22 hours and 20 minutes. In 1931, I flew from Los Angeles, California to New York in 11 hours and 15 minutes. That first flight was the first time that the continent had ever been crossed in less than one day. The second flight was the first time it had ever been crossed in less than half a day. Carl Tui Spots and Ira Aker flew seven days in 1929 without landing. The uh, question mark flight was an, uh, an endeavor uh, to use refueling as a means of keeping the plane in the air for a long time. The driving uh, 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 inspiration behind it, I uh, believe, was Ira Aker. On the uh, course between uh, San Diego and uh, uh, Burbank, we passed over the home of Mrs. Spott's uh, father and mother. And every time he passed over, uh, she would take my uh, oldest daughter, who was then about six or seven, out to see us go overhead. And on the fifth or sixth day, she uh, pointed us out to uh, Taddy and said, Taddy, there's your daddy up there. He's been up in the air for five or six days, five for five days. Don't you think it's wonderful? And uh, Taddy looked up and said, said, no, I think it's dumb. But the flight did prove that refueling was practical. General Aker remembers an incident that forecast the need for equipment which would permit line flying. In 1919, flying in the Philippines from Manila to Stotzenburg, our station at that time, I ran into a typhoon and the rain was so heavy that I couldn't uh, see the horizon. I fell in a spin and only the fact that the Manila Bay was yellow and the rain was darker was I able to recover from the spin and fly home. Uh, to my surprise, I found for the first time that when you can't, couldn't see, you couldn't fly. I described this to Lieutenant Longfellow, later General Longfellow in the Second World War, and we began some crude experiments by hanging a plumb bob down on, across the instrument board and by putting a carpenter's level on the longeron, and got so that with these two aids, we could fly through cloud, through several thousand feet of cloud. And that was one of the uh, early days of um, uh, instrument flying. Ten years after General Aker's Manila experience, Jimmy Doolittle, in association with the Sperry Company, tackled the problem. I made the first blind flight, the first completely blind flight, taking off under a hood, flying a prescribed course, and landing back under the hood without ever having seen out of the airplane. The Great Depression had come. The industry was hard hit, but nevertheless, new companies developed to meet the increasing complexity of the airplane and its growing use of metals, electronics, and automatic controls. Dutch Kindleberger departed from Douglas to take over North American. Companies were formed bearing the famous names Bell, Fairchild, Northrop, Beach, Cessna. A World War Navy pilot, Leroy Grumman, left civil engineering to enter aviation. We knew that a conventional airplane wouldn't uh, get us an order. We finally ended up with the design of the first military fighter with retractable landing gear, for which we got a contract and which proved to be highly successful, having a speed far in excess of any current Army or Navy fighter of that time. But that's remained the opposite side of speed. Namely, the aircraft 
that could fly with no speed at all, that could take off from any spot and would not be in need of an airport at all. The 30s also were the years in which each summer, fierce competition was held to determine the best of the airplane breed. Proof of the individual airplanes, engines and pilots came in the national air races. With thousands looking on, the legendary pilots raced. Doolittle, Hazlip, Turner, Whitman, LeVere, Gulbach, Newman, Fuller, Jacqueline Cochran. And flyers still flew against the clock, across the continent, across the seas, and indeed around the world itself. Falcon, Post, Gatti, Bird, Hughes, Amelia Earhart, and wrong way, Corrigan. As the hour swung late in the 30s, the air races were curiously American. For in Europe and Asia, aviation was not a case of relatively puny efforts and some, such as America was providing, much of it from individual man and companies. Rather, the vast resources of powerful foreign nations now were thrown behind the construction of air forces designed to subdue the world or to defend against such aggression. In the United States, under the impact of a depression, Congress had scrapped the Morrow Board procurement plan and stopped providing appropriations for 1,800 military airplanes that had been scheduled. On New Year's Day, 1936, the Army Air Corps had only 300 planes fit for war duty. A year later, we had dropped to sixth place among powers in air combat strength, although our industry was judged to be technically at least 18 months ahead of foreign competition. airplanes, there would have been no Munich. France had squandered a first-rate air power while she sat behind the Maginot Line. The British, too, had let the Axis powers outstrip them. Frantically, both countries turned toward the United States, aware that, in the very act of running hard to meet crisis after crisis, an emphasis had been placed upon research, experiment, and development, which gave the United States technically superior aviation equipment. So the free world turned to the United States not only for airplanes, but all of those weapons embodying the modern arsenal, to expand its facilities, train workers, and to adapt its job shop operations to techniques of mass production took time. The tooling was still underway when Germany struck. Poland was shattered. of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen, who, undaunted by odds, 
unwearied in their constant challenge of mortal danger, are turning the tide of war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. <laughs> the people of America more surely of the bitter nature of modern war than the sneak punch that Japan threw at Pearl Harbor. The nation fell to work to expand its token battle forces and its production into a great tide of men and machines. The Japanese swept through the Pacific. Jimmy Doolittle and a little band of flyers carried the war home to them in a joint Navy Air Force operation. I've frequently been asked what was the purpose and what was the effect of the first Tokyo raid? Well, the purpose was to take the war to Japan, to show them that their island was not inviolate. The effect, well, the effect was to cause them to divert some of their military strength that was needed in the South Pacific to the protection of the home islands. The actual damaging effect was very little. Our airplanes were on the Hornet. We were intercepted just after daylight on the morning of April 18th, 1942, by Japanese surface craft. We took off immediately, proceeded to target, and all but one of the planes carried on to the coast of China. We carried one ton of bombs in each one of 16 airplanes. We dropped 16 tons of bombs on four or five different targets. When you realize that from the Marianas in the later stages of the war, B-29s were carrying as much as 6,000 tons of bombs in one operation and dropping them on a single target, you realize how puny our effort was. Slowly, the nation began to regain control of the air and the sea lanes that it had lost in the Pacific. The first great victory was the Battle of the Coral Sea. Captain Thatch, one of the Navy's ablest flyers and tacticians, remembers that battle and the subsequent Battle of Midway. If you're going to apply the principle of concentration of force, for example, You've got to work with other people and have a good system of teamwork. But the enemy concentrated on the dive bombers. At the same time, that let the torpedo planes in, and they did most of the damage. On the other hand, in the Battle of Midway later, the enemy fighters concentrated on the torpedo planes, and the dive bombers came in almost unmolested. I could see them coming down like a huge waterfall and there were practically no misses. They were the ones that did the job in the Battle of Midway. With its growing stream of trained soldiers, sailors and airmen equipped with improved weapons, the United States and her allies took the offensive. Rommel was driven from Africa. Sicily and Italy were invaded. From their bases in England, American bombers began to strike at the heart of Germany under the direction of General Spatz. Strategic bombing was one of the ways of winning the war. And uh, our fighter operations, in a large measure, developed into uh, covering operations for the bombers. In order to do that, we had to have uh, the development that had taken place. Good radio, so the leader of the uh, fighter outfits could not only talk to his own men, but be in communication with the bombers. And uh, uh, in turn, get some guidance from uh, ground control stations uh, on the ground by radio. Uh, this resulted in a different type of fighting and a different type of operation. But it uh, proved conclusively in World War II that the airplane had developed to such an extent that air warfare became a different war altogether than land and sea warfare. <laughs> 
Wellwood Beale, a member of the team of designers who created the B-17, saw the airplane altered from a defensive to an offensive weapon. The conception of strategic air bombing uh, uh, was not uh, fully developed at that point. But uh, when we got to England, uh, it was obvious that uh, to use these bombers uh, to the greatest advantage, that we would have to uh, not only get the enemy's uh, supply lines, but uh, the places where he manufactured uh, his uh, military equipment. The British uh, thought it would be easier to do it at night. It'd have much greater chance of success and would be less vulnerable to enemy fighters. And they called their bombing saturation bombing. They dropped large numbers of bombs on uh, a large industrial area. The Americans, however, uh, decided that with the B-17 and the B-24, that they could pinpoint a specific target. For instance, the ball bearing factory at Swinefoot. Uh, they, uh, in order uh, to do the job properly, decided that it should be done at daytime, where their bomb site was the most effective. Step by step, the Allies began sweeping back across the reaches of the Pacific. setting the stage for the aerial assault on Japan itself. control of the air. The massive, intricate, highly trained combat team that America had put together at a stupendous cost dissolved almost overnight. A free people yielded to a free impulse. They demobilized their men and discarded much of their equipment. In the field of aviation alone, they had built an incredible 96,318 airplanes in the war year of 1944. Two years later, the production had shrunk to 1,669 planes. From fewer than 6,000 passengers the airlines had hauled in 1926, they quickly rose to where in 1952 they carried 24 million passengers, 12 billion passenger miles. 
The Wright brothers' vision was still the goal of virtually all men in aviation, such as Robert Gross, whose industrial team produced the Constellation series. Of course, it's obvious to, I guess, everyone that the airplane has been preponderantly military since its start many years ago. But there are signs, particularly in the last few years, that perhaps it wasn't always going to be ponderantly a military weapon. Man and science must go forward hand in hand. Germany had employed guided missiles brutally, but without decisive effect. Simultaneously, England and Germany had put a few airplanes in the air powered by a radical new type of engine, the jet turbine. The jet became really important in aviation. The accumulated engineering know-how that this country had built up with its piston engine equipment suddenly became very much less important. Russia's abrupt belligerence forced this country's attention upon the air power we had let melt away. For the third time in little more than a generation, the nation set about building a modern air arm. This one to be shaped around the fantastic speeds the gas turbine engine provided. Then, in 1948, when the Russians sealed off the land corridors leading to western Berlin, the United States, England, and France countered with a famous Berlin airlift. From their bases outside the Iron Curtain, a steady stream of airplanes flew night and day, supplying West Berlin's two million residents with food, fuel, and medicine. Finally, the communists capitulated and reopened the land corridor. Then, they sent their minions into war in Korea. There, the United Nations chose to stand and fight. It was a strange, bitter, circumscribed war. The Air Force's prime striking weapon, its strategic air command, was ruled out of bounds. The first sustained jet combat in history took place in a quadrangle of sky up to 40,000 feet above the Earth, but always south of the Yalu River. Russia sent aloft a first-rate jet fighter, the MiG. Only the Air Force's saber from the United Nations array of fighter planes could match it. It was a war in which transport airplanes flew 7,000 miles to deliver materiel and to return sick and wounded men. And it was a war in which the helicopter, with its ability to fly standing still and land anywhere, did a multitude of jobs. Among them, transporting literally thousands of wounded from the battlefield to rear area hospitals for prompt surgical attention. Under the impact of Korea, the nation had begun again to turn out modern aircraft in quantities. Monday Peel, the chairman of the Industries Association. That we as an aircraft industry are at the present time turning out about 14,000 airplanes. At the moment, we are a healthy industry. We have to pour back a tremendous amount of funds into research and development, funds that we earn when we make the airplanes. This is a very healthy thing. It creates competition. We want competition. Dutch Kindleberger, whose organization built the Sabre, pictures the sky 10 miles high as man flies at a speed approaching that of sound. Today, we're flying at very great speeds and at very high altitudes. As a matter of fact, up in the area at which a lot of the fighting is being done, around 50,000 feet, we have a different world. It's a thin, blue, dark blue air the, the sun doesn't shine so brilliantly because there's nothing to reflect it. There's no plane of reference for the pilots, such as hills or clouds or sky. In such an atmosphere as this, even a bomber is hard to see. And the trouble that we are facing, the future, is not the sound barrier. We know how to fly through that now. The thing that is bothering everybody is the thermodynamic barrier. The Air flowing over an airplane at these very high speeds by friction will heat up the surface of the airplane. As a matter of fact, if we go to Mach number two, which is twice the speed of sound at sea level, the surface of the airplane will get hot very rapidly and will stabilize at about 500 degrees. Well, since ordinary aluminum alloy loses half its strength by 350 degrees, and that even titanium and steels begin to give trouble at 500 and 600 degrees, it's obvious that we are in a great deal of difficulty in the future. 
There also are many things like hydraulic fluid. We don't know how to make hydraulic fluid that won't boil away at this temperature. We don't know how to make packings that won't seize at this temperature, or bearings, or lubricants. In fact, if the bubble with which everybody is familiar gets soft and would lose its shape and disappear at 300 degrees. So we have ahead of us a great deal of research and a long, long time of trouble before we're going to be going anything like the speeds at which our magazine supplement writers uh, seem to think we're ready for tomorrow. Modern test pilots who fly at sonic speeds and incredible altitudes take an equally factual view of their calling. Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly through the sonic barrier, and Bill Bridgman, a test pilot who has flown almost twice the speed of sound and has piloted a plane at an altitude of 79,000 feet, discussed their calling in language peculiarly their own. I certainly enjoyed the work. I think launching is the only safe way to get into that kind of flying. It's a heck of a lot safer than takeoff. Yeah, and you burn so much fuel when you take off before you get up to the altitude where the airplane could drop you. And I actually, I personally think that's the most fun involved in a flight is when the guy cuts you loose, you're just hanging there for a minute, just like on a roller coaster. Yeah. You were pretty close to stall, too, when you came out of there, weren't you? Yeah. You uh, 29? Uh, we stalled at around 240 indicated uh, with full fuel load. So uh, well, one time, I remember Jack Ridley, we had a release failure, and he dropped me out at about 180 indicated, and I didn't know which end was up for a while. <laughs> well... I, I noticed on the Skyrocket that when we first dropped out, you could kind of feel the stall by watching the boom out there. When the boom began to shake while she was on the nipple. I don't know if you can see it bend. See, well, I see it oscillate a little bit, yeah. And so the airplane has evolved from the Wrights, whose first flights at Kitty Hawk were at speeds hardly faster than an athlete can run, to speeds today where the Bridgmans, the Jaegers, and the Johnstons travel faster than a bullet. Horizons far beyond today's achievements still beckon. Your name, sir? Frank D. Long. Have you flown before? Yes, I've flown before. 